Hello class, welcome to the next segment in lecture 23 and in this segment we're going to take a look at some of the features in the atmosphere that we look for to determine whether hail is going to be a significant threat or, or not. So just like we did with the segment on tornadoes, we're going to be looking at this as sort of favorable versus unfavorable, just taking a look at two columns here. And with that, let's go ahead and dive right into it. So one of the first things that you should look for to determine if hail might be a potential hazard is to look at the mid-level lapse rates. That is, if you look at the layer between about uh, 700 millibars and 500 millibars, or even 850 millibars to 500 millibars, if you look at that layer, if your temperature decreases very rapidly with height, then that means the updrafts have a chance to be much more explosive, uh, much more intense. And of course, the more intense the updraft, then the larger the hailstones that can potentially form inside of a thunderstorm. And of course, the uh, flip side of this would be if you have shallow mid-level lapse rate. So if your temperature doesn't decrease very rapidly with height, uh, which a glittering example of this might be a hurricane. Uh, if you take a look at a sounding inside of a hurricane, uh, the temperature is actually very warm. And it, the temperature decreases very gradually as you go up into the atmosphere, which is uh, one of the reasons why hurricanes don't produce any hail at all. It's because it's just too warm inside the, inside the mid-level areas in the, in the hurricane. But in the, out over the, in the southeast and the plains on a good severe weather day, you actually can end up with some very cold temperatures at around 500 millibars, which can support some significant hail. And that's another thing that you want to look for. You want to see if the mid-level temperatures are very cold. Uh, usually a good value for this would be around minus 5 or minus 10 Celsius. Of course, in the height of winter, you're going to have uh, very, very cold mid-level temperatures. But of course, that's not going to guarantee you're going to have uh, hail in the winter. In fact, it's pretty uncommon to see any sort of hail in the winter, but it actually can happen. There are some cases where uh, some large hail can fall out of elevated thunderstorms in the winter, but usually not something to uh, not something that you're going to encounter very often. And again, contrast this with uh, something that you would find in a hurricane, where if you look at the 500 millibar temperature, it's actually uh, right around freezing or just above freezing, so you're actually not going to get any hail forming at all at around 500 millibars versus a nice uh, plane setup where you're going to have uh, much colder temperatures at around 500 millibars, and that's going to support uh, the production of ice, uh, large chunks of ice that can cause significant damage. And again, you also want to, ideally for uh, significant hail, that is hail over two inches in diameter, you want to see strong deep layer shear. And this is the same rule of thumb that we've seen in the case of tornadoes, where you want to have at least 35 to 40 knots of surface to six or surface to eight kilometer shear or effective shear. And uh, again, that's just so you can get supercells. If you get supercells forming, then you have a much better chance of getting more organized updrafts that have a better chance of producing very large hail. And you can get a uh, large hail with moderate deep layer shear, and even in single cell thunderstorms, which has have almost no vertical shear to speak of. But if you want the really big hail, you definitely want supercell thunderstorms, which means you want strong deep layer shear present. And again, you can get you can get severe hail potentially out of a single cell thunderstorm, but it's much harder to accomplish, and the thunderstorm's not going to last very long. So ideally, you want stronger deep layer shear to get a big time hail event. And another thing that you want to see uh, is high values of most unstable cape, which indicates you've got an unstable atmosphere. Now, something you don't want to do is you don't want to take a look at MU cape. Say this is very high. This is a high value of cape, so there's going to be significant hail. It actually turns out that uh, cape by itself is not a very good predictor for maximum hail size. A much better predictor is uh, the steepness of the lapse rates, or lack thereof. And the reason why is because, remember with the CAPE values, the CAPE equation that we derived, we've made a lot of assumptions about processes that we're ignoring in the atmosphere. So yes, you might have a high value of CAPE, but keep in mind there's a lot of physical processes in the atmosphere that we ignore to derive that equation for CAPE. So in practice, it turns out that looking at the mid-level lapse rates is the best thing to look for when predicting the potential magnitude of hail and also using that in conjunction with deep layer shear. But the reason why MU CAPE is something that you can use as part of uh, your assessment for hail potential is the fact that thunderstorms that produce hail don't have to be surface-based. Uh, again, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, elevated thunderstorms versus surface-based thunderstorms. In the case of an elevated thunderstorm, which is drawing its warm, moist air in, uh, the, its fuel supply of warm moist air in from a level above the ground and not from the ground level itself, those thunderstorms can pose a significant threat of hail, in fact. Uh, 
sometimes uh, usually those thunderstorms tend to be weaker, but occasionally you can get an elevated thunderstorm that is sufficiently intense to produce large hail if the rest of the ambient uh, conditions are favorable for significant hail. But this is just uh, something to keep in mind that to get significant hail events, you don't necessarily need a surface-based thunderstorm. In fact, you can get some fairly sizable hail from thunderstorms that are draw not drawing in their fuel supply from more moist air near ground level. And if your atmosphere is largely stable, then of course your updrafts are going to have a tough time uh, reaching speeds that will support much in the way of significant hail. Another thing that you ideally want to see is a shallow freezing level in the atmosphere. So that's ideally going to be around three kilometers above ground level. Um, if you've got a if you've got a freezing level that's lower than that, then you're going to potentially have a big time hail event. Uh, there was one hail event in particular, which was April 26, 2015, down in central Texas, where the freezing level was around 2,700 meters above the ground. And that supercell produced some monstrous hail. I think it was the largest hail size was about four and a half inches of diameter, which is about the size of a grapefruit. Uh, definitely not something you want you or your car or anybody to be near when that's coming out of the thunderstorm. But typically, if you got higher freezing levels, that means you've got um, less of a window, uh, less of a layer in the atmosphere where hail can form. Uh, four to five kilometers, again, you can get hail in an environment like that, but it's going to be a little bit harder to accomplish uh, any significant hail sizes if the freezing level is very high off the ground. So again, high freezing levels, not particularly favorable for hail events, although you can, still get, you can still get large hail if your freezing level is really high, but if your freezing level is too high, then you can just forget about hail altogether. Uh, if you do get hailstones forming, they're probably going to melt before they even reach the ground. So let's take a look at a sounding that sort of highlights all the stuff that we've been talking about. So, MU Cape, over 6,000 joules per kilogram. So those thunderstorms are going to have some, uh, there's a lot of uh, buoyancy potentially in the atmosphere. But again, the main thing that you want to look for is the lapse rates. And if you look between 700 millibars and 500 millibars, you can see the temperature does decrease pretty rapidly. If we go into the actual numbers, it's right around 8 degrees C per kilometer. And that's usually around that, around that numbers when we start becoming worried about the potential for significant hail, especially if we have strong vertical shear, which we do, 50 to 60 knots, that'll definitely support supercells. And those supercells will definitely, in this environment, have the shot at producing some significant hail. And again, ideally, you want supercells, which means you want isolated thunderstorms. You can get large hail out of a squall line, but it's a little bit harder to, it's a little bit harder to get uh, really significant hail out of a squall line. So ideally, if you want a big time hail event, you want nice isolated supercells that have uh, steep lapse rates and strong deep layer shear to work with. So that's going to do it for this segment on hail. And in the next segment, we're actually going to take a look take a look at a bit more of a side topic and discuss why the plains tends to host the most significant hail events. And it has to be has to do with the unique topography topography found in the central United States, in the central continental United States. So that's what we're going to discuss in the next segment. And then after that, we will do the same thing, uh, take a look at the criteria for uh, certain hazards, but there we're going to focus on flooding. So next segment, we'll be talking about uh, features that, uh, uh, why the planes actually host so many significant hail events. And after that segment, we will discuss the criteria that you typically look for to diagnose uh, flash flooding. So with that, I will see you all in the next segment.